going to say, when, uh, when Barbara asked the question about who doesn't like the Cardinals, I didn't realize it was a rhetorical question, so sorry for those in the back. <laughs> I created a stir when I raised my hand. It wasn't my intention. So, uh, so last week we did something different as we worked our way uh, through 1 Corinthians. We had five different preachers up here. Behind the scenes, we did our best survivor, and uh, those four have been voted off the island, and I have been, uh, I have been asked back. So I thank you guys for you who voted. Um, if you didn't vote, sorry, too late. Uh, so we are, we are going to continue in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I don't know if I won or if I've lost, because we are doing the closing of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19 to 24. This is the closing of the letter. For those of you who like to flip, I'm going to be doing some flipping into Acts as well. So Acts 18 is a good place to put a bookmark. That will give you a, a place that you can hop between. So that's where we're going to be reading. Uh, even though this is the closing of 1 Corinthians, we aren't done with 1 Corinthians. We actually skipped uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, and we're going to be going back to that as we talk about the resurrection leading up to Easter. So we're still going to be in 1 Corinthians. We just uh, saved the... The, his talking about the resurrection for the Easter uh, time frame. So that will be a, the next series or the next small set that we're going to go through as we finally will wrap up 1 Corinthians. Uh, for, for us, we're going to talk about a closing. And sometimes you can say, well, what do you get out of a closing of a letter? It's just, you know, a bye. It's a, well, we're done. I said all I need to say. And, and it's the conclusion why should we take time to talk about it? And really, it's that same idea of there might be things in our life that we like to skip because we go, ah, it's just not important enough. You know, for my house, that's folding the laundry. All right, so we have plenty of clean laundry, but it sits in big piles. And it's folding the laundry, it's just, we're just going to skip that. We don't have time for that. And so you can think of those many things that you go, well, we're just going to skip because is it really important enough? And God's word, we believe God's word is written for and, and given to us. We believe that it all is relevant. And so we don't want to just skip over something like a closing of a letter because of convenience. We want to do it because God has given it to us, and we want to try and see what can we learn. And we can learn a lot of things from uh, this closing. So we're going to read it, and then we're going to uh, start seeing what we can get out of it. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 to 24. It says, the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so this is his closing. This is how he's closed, and we've covered a lot of things in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is not a book that's light on subject matters. He even does a lot of hopping around and goes through, as, as you've seen as we've walked through it, where sometimes he just seems to hop from one thing to the other, yelling in short bursts to say, hey, make sure you're getting this correct, and make sure you're doing this. And now he's closing. And within this closing, there's a few things that we want to pull out of it. And one, the first thing we're going to focus on is his greetings. And he really does three different types of greetings in this close here. So the first type of greeting or this first group is the churches are sending greetings. And so you see him say uh, that the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Well, just to again remind us of what this is doing. Remember, Paul is in Ephesus. We know that from uh, around... In, Earlier in this chapter, he's writing from Ephesus. He's in the middle of his third missionary journey. How did he get to Ephesus? Well, we don't have the map, but you can read in uh, Acts 19. Acts 19.1 says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the interior road and arrived at Ephesus. So in other words, he went right through Asia Minor. Went right through. We don't have the details of exactly where were his stops, where was his night stays. Was it only for one night? Was it for a week? Things like that. But we know he walked right through Asia, what we would say modern-day Turkey. And so we know that when Paul's doing this, he's gone through and stopped on his way to Ephesus at many of the churches in Asia. And so he's had interactions there. And again, we don't know some of those specific interactions, but we can tell by the character of Paul that the interactions are probably similar to his other interactions in different churches. And you can read through many, much of Acts, 
and see that Paul interacts with churches and interacts with new cities and who knows if he planted a church along the way, but we know he interacts with a passion and a purpose. And you guys might have your various favorite Paul stories. One of my favorite Paul stories is from his first missionary trip in Acts 14. And this is one of those where I think it speaks very clearly to the perseverance of Paul. If you remember in Acts 14, and we won't have time to read through this, but you can go through Acts 14 on your own afterwards, that you know he ends up running away from a couple of towns and heads to Lystra. And when he's there, he starts preaching, and then some troublemakers come and follow him from the previous towns, and uh, they basically stone him to death or what they thought was to death. And so the end of, in the middle of Acts 14, it says that they drug Paul out of the city after stoning him, thinking he was dead. And what does Paul do? It says the disciples gathered around him, and Paul gets back up and heads right back into the city. Like, Paul had a perseverance. Paul had a determination to say, listen, it doesn't matter what the world does to me. Like, I have a purpose here. And so we don't know what he did on his trip through Asia, we just get one verse that says, all right, he starts in point A and ends up in Ephesus, and he travels through Asia to get there. But if we look at his character, we know that he interacted with places. He didn't try and hide. He wasn't intimidated that maybe they don't like me here. He got stoned and went right back into the city to be like, hey, I forgot to tell you. Here's a couple other things. All right? Like, that's not the average person. And so when he sends greetings from Asia... What's the point? Well, the point is churches should care about each other. That the churches might not be all connected, they might not interact very much, but we're supposed to have a care for the body of Christ. We very much are a local church located here in St. Peter's, but we are supposed to care for the universal church, for the church that is all over the world. So when we meet together, we're not the only people meeting together, and English is not the only language in which people are being able to praise the Lord in. It's not the only language that they can read God's word in. And that's a great blessing. And for us, we're supposed to care about those churches. The heart of grace, one of the things that grace has been known for from the beginning is desiring to church plant. We're not supposed to write off the stone bridge and go, okay, you're supposed to be on your own by now. We're supposed to care for the stone bridges. And that's in our backyard. And then we're supposed to care for church plants in France through our, one of our missionaries all right? We're supposed to care for other churches as they meet around the world, knowing that we're part of this universal church. We're part of a body of believers that is serving a great God. So when greetings are sent from churches of Asia, that's not just, yeah, so-and-so says hi. That's truly a, hey, Corinth church, Corinthians, you're cared about. Not just me, Paul, but the churches in Asia that I've just passed through all are caring about you. They're worried about you. They want to make sure you realize, hey, you're not, on, you're not in this alone. We're in this together. And so greetings are sent from the churches in Asia. What else? Next thing is greetings are sent from the brothers and sisters. It says, Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets in their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. So whether you want to say all the brothers and sisters, or really we're going to focus on Aquila and Priscilla, a certain set of the brothers and sisters are greeting them. So what's so special about Aquila and Priscilla? We've covered this a couple weeks back, but uh, that was the snow week that we talked about who's Aquila and Priscilla, and so we're going to remind everybody. Aquila and Priscilla, uh, we'll actually flip to Acts 18, read who uh, Aquila and Priscilla are. One through four is their introduction here. They make uh, a few appearances. But this is the core, and you can, you can see a lot of what's going on and why Paul has a connection to these two. So it says in uh, Acts 18.1, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native, native of Pontus, who had rec recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. So where does Paul first met, meet Aquila and Priscilla? In Corinth. Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned by name because they have some ties to Corinth, as in they lived there. Why were they living in Corinth? This is back in when it says, uh, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So the persecution of the Jews had begun. Claudius, the Roman Empire emperor, basically goes, Jews out of Rome. And Aquila and Priscilla were told to get out. Now, they weren't ones who were going, let's just go to the next town over. 
they basically were like, all right, if the persecution started there, we're not going to the next town over. Let's, let's try and go find a new place where we have a little more freedom, an ability to praise our God in a, in a way in which we desire. And so they didn't even stay in Italy. They completely left Italy. And a lot of reality, this is still the core of immigration today. The heart of immigration in a lot of ways is they're trying to get away from persecution and things they're not able to do to get to a place where they're able to do it. That's, that's the heart of a lot of things. And whether that's religious persecution, whether that's, you know, raising a family, whether that's, you know, the fiscal, whatever it is, this is not the let's make a statement on immigration, but the heart is still true. What was going on there of I can't do this here, so I'm not staying in Italy. We're moving. We're heading out. And so they end up in Corinth. Aquila and Priscilla are transplants now in Corinth. And you see that it continues. Uh, so Claudius kicks them out. It says, Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. They had something in common. They were tent makers. Paul's like, all right, I know how to do that. Can I join your business? Can I be like the hired hand? And he stays with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So Paul forms this pretty intimate relationship with Aquila and Priscilla. He works with them, and he works with them making tents. And he doesn't work with them for a couple days or a couple weeks. You see later on in, uh, in 11 of this chapter, 1811, that he ends up staying there for a year and a half. And so for a year and a half, he's working with, he's probably living with, and he's probably going to the synagogue with Aquila and Priscilla. And Aquila and Priscilla weren't the ones who were going, hey, let's get up front and let's be the, the point people, but they were needed in the support of the ministry. And you see the relationship that they have, because if you hop down uh, still here in Acts 18 to verse 18, it says, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, and then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. So when Paul realizes, all right, my ministry here in Corinth, my year and a half is up, I need to continue. Paul was never a long-term person. He was going, listen, there's a lot of churches I need to get to. And so his year and a half is up, what does he do? He probably turns to Aquila and Priscilla and goes, I have to keep moving. Will you come with me? And their answer was yes. And so they move on. And he, they end up in Ephesus, and that's where he leaves Aquila and Priscilla. And so you're saying... All right, what's the point? Like, that's a great little uh, history of Aquila and Priscilla. They send greetings, yeah. Well, the point is, true family is not always a blood relationship. Sometimes true family are your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Paul's true family was probably Aquila and Priscilla. We don't know this exactly, but we know that we can see in his writings about them that he definitely has a heart in a, in a soft spot for Aquila and Priscilla. Individuals who are willing to do ministry, individuals who are willing to pack up and leave with him, individuals who are willing to support him by having him on in their tent-making business. In a variety of ways, Aquila and Priscilla ministered to Paul. One of Paul, in Paul's, even in Paul's final letter in 2 Timothy, he mentions Aquila and Priscilla there at the end of uh, 2 Timothy, when he says, greet Aquila and Priscilla. Again, when he's final words to Timothy, he's like, make sure you say hi to Aquila and Priscilla. Like, they're important. So sometimes, this Christian family, sometimes the, the roots are deeper here. And that's, that's all right. When Paul's writing back to Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla are now in Ephesus with him. But, remember, they were in Corinth. They ministered with Paul. They helped plant the church. You list the things that we don't see but had to have happened behind the scenes for that year and a half. They have a heart for Corinth, too. And so when he writes the letter back, he's going, yes, the brothers and sisters, various ones, but specifically, so you know, Aquila and Priscilla, still greeting you, still loving you, still caring about you. That's something that we need to do, is to realize we still need to care about individuals. And then this third group that sends greetings is Paul himself. So Paul himself actually takes it in 21 and says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. So up to this point, Paul's been really dictating this letter. He's been speaking it. Someone else has been writing it down. And so in this dictation, he now takes the pen himself and goes, all right, at this end here, I want them to realize it's me. And he signs it himself and goes, listen, this is my own hand. 
I'm sending you my own personal greetings. So the personal greetings are coming from Paul. Paul, again, has a heart for the Corinth church. So we have two letters in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We know he wrote to them. Again, not short letters. Paul's writing and trying to deal with a lot of things that are going on in their church. We know he lived there for a year and a half, but you can actually, most people estimate that he's had at least seven interactions with them. Three different visits that you can track through, uh, as well as they expect that there's been four different letters he's written. We have two of them, and what do they mean by four? Well, you can see that, uh, just pointing to one example, in 1 Corinthians 5.9 that we've preached about a long time ago, but in 5.9 he actually mentions this phrase in passing. I have written, in you, I've written you in my letter not to associate, and he goes into a point where he's basically referencing a letter he's already written. It wasn't intended to be scripture, and we're not going to say, okay, we have to go find that letter and add it to the Bible. But the point is, Paul's interacted with Corinth numerous times. Most people guess seven, that he's had four different letters, because he references these other letters in First and Second Corinthians, and that he's had three different visits. So within this, Paul's, Paul has like some skin in the game. He's there going, listen, I'm attached to this church. I care about this church. So much so that at the end of my letter, even though I've spoken it all and it's written, I could easily say and sign my name that Paul says hi. He goes, nope, give me the pen. I want them to realize it's me. And he signs his name. This is me. This is my own handwriting. And so Paul cares enough to write it. So what is the point of that? Christian lives should be deeply connected. We should be connected to each other. We should go through the highs and lows with each other. Now, that's a scary thing because what a simple point that means, it means there's a lot of risk in that. That if you truly want to be deeply connected to each other, you put yourself out there. There could be hurts, there could be pains, there could be sacrifices that you're being asked to make. And Paul's going, yep, I'm willing to do all of that for Corinth, but are we willing to do all of that for even a grace or a sister church or some of our missionaries? Because it could hurt. Listen, sin is throughout the world. Sin is throughout this church. It's not like you come to this church and you're like, ooh, we're going to be perfect here and no one's ever going to get mad at each other. No, nope. we're going to sin and we're going to have frustrations and you might have built large chunks of your life into someone and they make a silly decision. And all of a sudden you're going, man, they must, and you, you personalize it. They must not like me. They must not care about me. They must not realize how much I care for them. Well, listen, sin is sin. It's going to happen. And it's a risk that when you attach yourself, that when you're deeply connected, there might be some deep hurts that come along with that. But it's not our job to avoid the deep hurts. It's our job to get in there. It's our job to care about people enough that we're willing to risk the deep hurts. Listen, I don't go to funerals because I go, man, this is a great place to go. I go to funerals because I go, I want to make people to make sure they realize that I'm in this with them. I care about them. I want them to realize that, listen, it's very easy to bunker in and go, all right, I'm just going to mourn on my own. No, you're not supposed to. This body is here to support each other. You're not supposed to go behind your closed doors and wrestle. You're supposed to use the support of the body to help you. I go to funerals to make sure people realize that. I go to high school graduations to make sure people realize that, that I don't want to be there just in the sad times, I want to be there in the good times. That's our job as a church, to support each other in both the bad times and the good times. Does it hurt sometimes? Yes. If you really want to be in Christian ministry, if you want to make an impact in the world, you're going to put risk out there, and odds are at points you're going to get burnt. And don't dwell on that. You say, all right, I'm going to get back up. You weren't stoned. You're not left for dead. All right? We need to get over it, and we need to keep moving. That's what Paul, in his connection to the Corinthians, is. It's a point in which he's going, we need to get over, and we need to keep moving. I love you this deeply. And so he says that in his letter. So those three points, I'm going to take a little uh, sidetrack here. Those three points are very easy to talk about, and, hey, this is... This is a, a nice thing to pull from the Bible, but what does that look pr like practically? And what that looks like practically is I have, a, I have an example that we're going to deal with here in church. And so the example is uh, Bruce McAtee. And if you didn't know uh, who Bruce McAtee is, he's one of our missionaries. He's over in Greece. I was going to say, 
within this, uh, Bruce came from this church. Uh, you say grew up in his church. His family was one of the uh, original members. Many of you probably know him a lot better than I do. All right, like I was one who had to call around this week and be like, by the time I got here, Bruce was overseas and he's a name on a wall. Like, tell me about Bruce. Like, let me understand what Bruce was like before he left. So I'm trying to convey what Bruce is like, and you guys probably have a lot better stories than I do about what Bruce was like. But let me convey a few things, because whether you want to say Bruce is sending greetings from a church in Greece, or whether Bruce is sending greetings from brothers and sisters in Greece, or whether you're saying Bruce is sending personal greetings, whichever one of these three greetings you want to classify him under, Bruce has a connection to this church that many of us, and especially the next two services that I'm going to preach at, probably don't realize how deep his connection is to this church. And why when Bruce writes to us and expresses a love towards grace, that that love is founded within years of connection to us. And so Bruce McAtee, and if you don't know, that's his family, uh, Irene, uh, Grace, and Emily. And I often wonder whether Grace has a couple meanings, whether that's how connected he is to this church. I do not know. I know there's a great grace of God, so I'm going to give him to say it was God. But So those are, that's the family. One of the reasons I thought Bruce was a great example is because this June, Bruce comes home on a one-year sabbatical, and guess where he's going to spend the school year? Most of his time here at Grace Community Chapel. So this is a guy who's going to come back, and for some of us, we might be like, well, I've never seen you before. Bruce has a little history with us. It starts, his history starts with, he was uh, brought here when Steve, uh, his father, Steve, uh, came as one of the founding members of Grace. And so Steve brings his family with him and goes, all right, we're going to Grace. And Steve was at Hope. And so some of you who go all the way go back to Hope might know Steve from Hope. You might know Steve from Grace. Uh, Steve, unfortunately, passed away within this past year. And so uh, he's now with his Lord. But stories about Steve abound. So Bruce grew up under a guy who definitely had a heart to say, I want to be the hands and feet of the Lord. He had a great practical wisdom and saying, how do we meet needs in a very practical way? He had a desire to help and to teach his kids that it's not about them, but it's about a much bigger idea. And listen, we have some great deacons. We have some great people who have hearts of service here. All right? Like, we could parade people up every week and just talk about, hey, and these are the countless hours this person put in towards, you know, construction, towards painting, towards keeping our outside looking very nice, towards flowers, towards, you know, like... There's a lot of credit that goes into this church. Steve was one of those great examples. One of the stories I even heard was Steve's simple examples would be like he ran a construction business, and so for him it wouldn't be out of the norm to show up and put a roof on a widow's house. So this isn't show up and like I'll fix a door that's off the hinge. He'd put a whole roof on the house and say, nope, this is my service to you. Like Steve had a heart, and guess who Steve drug along with him? Bruce. Guess what, Bruce? We're going to go put a roof on someone's house. Are they paying? Nope. Widow at the church. Let's go. This is, this is our overtime. So this is what Bruce grew up here. He grew up knowing that and showing up at maybe some of you guys' houses and putting in manual labor because he goes, I have this giftings, I have this ability, I'm going to share it. That's the father he grew up with. And then Bruce grows up and has this heart for the Lord. He actually was the original youth pastor here at this church. So actually, I was told there are still a few people here who might actually have been in his youth group. And so I was given one or two names. I won't call them out from the stage. But you might be able to find someone in here who now looks at Bruce, not as Bruce the missionary, but Bruce is, Bruce is the youth pastor. And uh, he probably made a lot more mistakes as the youth pastor than he did as the missionary. You know, like, youth pastors are known for that. Um, so, <laughs> but the thing I kept hearing is Bruce had no, like, half speed. Like, Everything was all out. Everything was extremely high intensity. And so whether it's working, whether it's serving the Lord, whether it's whatever it was, Bruce was all in for this. He was a great model of who to be as a Christian. And Bruce developed the heart to go overseas. And so this church sent him to Greece to say, all right, he connected to a mission there, he wants to be full-time there, and Bruce heads over and has been serving now in Greece. I actually don't even know how many years. I should know that. But uh, he's been over in Greece. And so for us, many of us 
who've only been here, I've been here five years. You know, some of us are going, well, I've never known Bruce, or I've never seen Bruce, or I saw him once or twice when he came back, and from the stage he said something. Well, Bruce has more than a little history. He was here from the beginning. He was here when the upper youth room was the sanctuary, was a heck of a lot of things. It was everything, all right? He's been here through many things. He has memory and history with a lot of people in this church. So when he comes back in June, again, correlate this to the, this closing in Corinthians. When he comes back in June, he's the Aquila Priscilla. He's the Paul. He's the churches who comes back and goes, hey, I care about you guys. And some of us go, we don't even know you. Well, I care about you guys is going to be what Bruce is saying. He does. He has a deep passion because of his long history with us. Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla, the churches in Asia, have a deep passion for the Corinthian church because they have history, because they have a heart, because they know that that's what God wants them to have. So when Bruce and his family are here for the next year, get to know him. Because guess what? He's not staying forever. He's saying, all right, I'm on sabbatical for a year, and then his heart's still in Greece. And he's going to go back to Greece. But for us, we should be connecting because... This is what we do as a body. We support each other in numerous ways. Bruce is going to spend time with us and has an appreciation for us that we might not ever understand because we didn't experience it. Guess what? Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla in the churches have an appreciation for Corinth that they might never understand. Not everyone in Corinth gets this letter and goes, oh, Aquila and Priscilla, I remember them. They go, who's Aquila and Priscilla? They were some of our founding members of this church. They helped us get from the ground floor to being established. Oh, so they probably uh, put in a little work. Yep. Bruce, the McAtee family, some of the ground figures of this church, they put in a little work. I'm not saying that they were the only ones, please, for some of the other original members sitting in this congregation. I'm not saying they did it all. But I'm saying it's a great example of a conclusion of, Cor of uh, Corinthians to say Paul writes back with a passion that some might never get. Guess what? Bruce is going to come with a passion that some of us might never get, but we have a year to get to know him and share his passion. So that's what the greetings that are being sent from the Corinthians are. Or to the Corinthians, I'm sorry. The greetings that are being sent to the Corinthians are full of passion and full of an attachment that not everyone understands, but they're still there. So that's just the greetings here. Now I'm going to have to fly through my last two points a little quicker, but... Two other points I have that I get from this conclusion. The first is, uh, verse 22, it says, If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. Some of yours might say Maranatha, which is just, come, O Lord. All right? Paul has already spent some time in this book warning about false teachings or things that he's worried about. He's nervous about individuals in Corinth who are popping up and not preaching the word not preaching Jesus. And guess what he has to write to him in 2 Corinthians? He has to yell at him because they're letting false teachers take root. What do we mean? Just pulling something real quick. 2 Corinthians 11.4, this is in the middle of his yelling, but it gets to the point. Good summary. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. He's in the middle of yelling at him, going, why are you putting up with all this false stuff? So we know, in 1 Corinthians, he's already yelling at him to say, hey, get your act together, you're, you're not standing on the right truth. We see in 2 Corinthians, he yells a little harder. Guess what? In his summary, and his conclusion, it's still one of those last statements of, make sure you get this right. Like, the curse is going to be on the individuals who aren't preaching the right thing, the individuals who are trying to take you away from Jesus and worship maybe themselves. He's trying in that last second of, all right, I got one line in my own handwriting, you know, one line in my own handwriting, and what does he say? He goes, all right, this is Paul. I'm writing this greeting in my own handwriting. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. He's worried about false teachers. Paul writes just a few sentences, and besides his greeting, the next thing he writes is, watch out for false teachers. Don't be fooled by the imposters. Still throughout the U.S., still throughout the world, there's individuals who might stand and hold a Bible in their hands 
and say you worship the person on the stage. No, the person on the stage should be able to be interchanged pretty easily. Although it was a joke, any of the five of us who were here last week should be able to stand up here and say the same thing. Listen, it's Jesus. That's it. If any of us start saying, hey, it's Dare Heilman or Jason Crude or, or Jim Harding, you know, listen, nope, it's not us. But there's going to be imposters. So he's warning them. Last breath, worry, don't, don't focus on the imposters. And then his final thing, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus, amen. He points back to the ultimate hope. In his own hand, he writes a greeting, he writes a warning of false teachings, and he points them towards the ultimate hope. And that ultimate hope, it's still only Jesus. It's still only Jesus. He's still the beginning and the end of everything. We might want to try and correct doctrine. We want to get sin out of our life. But if we ever try and say, my doctrine will save me, or my lack of sin will save me, we're still wrong. Paul's trying to correct that throughout 1 Corinthians, but he ends going, it's still only Jesus. It's still the fact of, no matter how good we are on earth, we can't earn it. God says, perfection is it. I'm not perfect. From a young age, we're not perfect. No one's ever accused my three-year-old of being perfect, all right? <laughs> Much less his dad. All right, so, so we know we're not perfect, and God's standard for heaven is still perfection. And that doesn't change. It hasn't changed back when it first happened. It doesn't change in a couple years where all of a sudden standards get changed. This isn't laws that you go, all right, we're just going to backtrack this law, and from now on, all right, if you were 90% good, you're in. Nope. And so we needed a, we needed a, uh, we needed a, uh, a bridge. And so Christ came, lived that perfect life, and when he had the right to go claim his heaven, he didn't. He went to a cross. That's the season we're about to celebrate. We're already in, really. But we're going to go through here, 1 Corinthians 15, and start to point to why is this cross so important? The cross is important because without the cross, without that death and without that resurrection, there is no bridge to heaven. But Jesus did it. Perfection, death for our sins, the grave couldn't hold him. Death had lost its sting because he rose again. That's still the main hope. That's still the only hope. We don't come offering one of many options. We come saying, it's still Jesus and nothing else. That's all we have to offer. For everything covered, confronted, warned, corrected, encouraged, taught, or clarified in this book, if you lose sight of Jesus, it's all for nothing. Paul's conclusion, you're loved, other brothers and sisters love you, watch out for the false teachings, and you lean into Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for being a God who loves us. We thank you for being a God who made that ultimate sacrifice. Lord, you sent your son to die on a cross because we couldn't earn heaven. And Lord, we thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for what you were willing to pay for us. Lord, we thank you for books like 1 Corinthians that cover so, ma so much material, Lord. We've been through so many ups and downs, through so many corrections and, and encouragements, Lord. But above all, you keep, Paul keeps pointing us back to Jesus. Lord, allow us to be a church that cares for each other. Allow us to be a church that's not afraid to get put ourselves out there to risk the hurts to build into the others. Allow us to be a church that truly has that heart for the universal church, for the people around us who need to know you, for the churches around us that need encouragement and support as they minister to their areas of the world. Lord, thank you for the Bruce McAtees of the world. Lord, that's just one example of a wall full of missionaries of a church full of people with a heart to serve you. Lord, we're not looking to prop Bruce up and worship Bruce. But thank you for the example and life he has set of a person who is willing to follow you. And wherever that may go, thank you for the Aquilas and Priscillas who said, I settled in Corinth, but I don't need to stay here. I'll continue on and plant another church and have another church meeting at my house. Thank you for the individuals in this room. 
the many ones who are doing so many things behind the scenes and they'll never be called up here on stage. But this church does not function without the body. And Lord, if there's in, anyone in, in this room who still hasn't said, Jesus is it, allow today to be the day in which heaven's gates swing wide and they realize, I don't carry burdens on my own. I don't do things, I don't earn heaven through my perfection or through my work, but it's only through the grace of God. Thank you for the grace of God. We ask all those things in Jesus' name. Amen.